from Kansas State University. This is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. Here's what's ahead. K-State's Dorvar Ruiz Diaz will talk about identifying nutrient deficiencies in soybean stands here in midsummer, how to interpret the appearance of those soybean plants, which can tip one off that there might be a nutrient problem. Also, from the team at the Beef Cattle Institute here at K-State, a look at two topics of interest to you cow-calf producers. Selecting software for use in herd breeding and nutrition management, and the merits of creep feeding those calves ahead of weaning. Today's Kansas Wheat Harvest Update features Extension Agricultural Agent Keith Van Skyke of the Twin Creeks Extension District, and K-State's Gus Vanderhoven with another stop, look, and listen. All that coming up on this Agriculture Today. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today. As always, thanks for being along with us. This segment is for you soybean producers. Hopefully your stands are up and going well now. However, as always happens any growing season, there are those occasions where soybeans might be looking a little anemic, and that could be at the hand of nutrient deficiency in those beans. How to identify that and sort out what's going on is our objective here now with Crop Nutrient Specialist Dorvar Ruiz Diaz, K-State Research and Extension alongside. Dorvar, knowing what's happening with soybeans has to do with identifying and understanding the symptoms. Yes, Eric, and, and this is the time of the year where we can start to see some chlorosis in, in some soybeans. And and the, really the, the challenge at this point is to find out what the potential uh, issue is. Obviously, it could be many things, but one of the common issues could be nutrient deficiencies. And, and so here's where we try to identify what could be the problem and uh, most importantly, what can we do about it uh, either this year or moving forward in the, in the following growing season. Uh, one of the things that I always emphasize in terms of to keep in mind what, what is the potential deficiencies is to think about the group of nutrients that we consider uh, mobile versus immobile in the plant. And if you think about the, uh, the nutrients that are mobile in the plants are typically the nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, the, you know, the, the main macronutrients. And so one characteristic about these nutrients are that the deficiencies essentially show up uh, usually in the older, uh, lower leaves. And this is because, uh, again, these are mobile in the plant, which means um, as the new leaves are growing, uh, these nutrients tend to move to that growing point and basically leaving the older leaves uh, deficient uh, in either, again, nitrogen, phosphorus, or potassium. And then the other uh, group of nutrients, obviously, are the immobile nutrients in the plant. And these are the deficiencies that always show up in the upper, younger leaves. Here is usually most of the micronutrients. Uh, so if you're looking at the young leaves, uh, looking at with chlorosis uh, issues, then it's very often going to be a micronutrient like iron, perhaps zinc, uh, secondary nutrient like sulfur as well. Uh, these are all immobile nutrients. And, and so again, this is one of the first steps I will consider as we are trying to figure out what the, the potential issues are. The most likely suspects here, though, are those more common nutrients that we work with routinely in our crop production, and uh, that's where one needs to focus on, Dorvar? Uh, that's, that's a good point, Eric, and, and I typically like to focus on the ones that are more common, of course, for us in Kansas, and uh, from the uh, macronutrients, uh, phosphorus, uh, potassium are often uh, going to be the, the main limiting ones in Kansas. We do have some nitrogen deficiency in some cases, and this will be especially as we're going going uh, to new grounds that maybe don't have a history of soybean uh, prior to in recent years. And so uh, perhaps nodulation is not uh, effective. And obviously in that situation, we may have some nitrogen deficiency as well. But then uh, P and K, for sure, uh, those are going to be uh, candidates. From the macronutrients, obviously iron chlorosis is fairly common for us in Kansas, especially if we're going Western Kansas, high pH situations. And obviously we, sulfur is something that's becoming more common. Uh, we haven't seen so much uh, yet in soybeans, but I think uh, it's something that I would pay close attention to. Uh, and one that could be also potentially zinc. Uh, and here is really what we all want to basically determine what specific nutrient is, is limiting. We really have a couple 
key growth stages where we can do plant sampling. If we are in the vegetative about V4 growth stage or so, uh, we can collect the whole plant and send this to, uh, for analysis. As we're getting later in the season uh, to about pot set, uh, we can collect the upper most fully developed trifolia, uh, collect multiple samples across the field uh, and send those for analysis. Ideally, we want to collect samples from healthy plants in that field as well as the plants that are showing chlorosis so we can uh, make a comparison and basically uh, determine what's a specific nutrient limiting. Uh, one thing that is very uh, important also is to have information on soil characteristics when we have these issues and this could be information coming from uh, recent soil samples that we collected uh, if we don't have recent soil um, analysis, then uh, this will be also a time to send some samples for diagnostic purpose, essentially, at this point, to find out what potential issues we may have. So that combination of tissue analysis and, and soil analysis will basically give us this, the information we need uh, in terms of what the problem is. Identifying what's going on is one thing, but knowing what's causing that deficiency is the next important piece of information here. Yes, Eric, and, and there are many potential factors. Uh, obviously, the key reason in many cases would be just low levels of these nutrients in the soil. And, and if we're thinking about phosphorus and potassium, that's often what happens. Uh, we do tend to see more and more potassium deficiency in particular developing uh, in the eastern part of the state. Uh, and we have to keep in mind, uh, soybean is a big user of potassium. And so um, uh, with good yields, uh, multiple years, uh, we're going to drive those uh, potassium levels lower over time. And so we start to see that, that issue in many cases, just lower uh, levels of nutrients in the, in the soil. Uh, and again, specifically important for potassium and phosphorus as well, which we basically manage based on, on soil tests. If we're thinking about nitrogen, and again, this is more of a problem in maybe new grounds, uh, maybe as a central and western part of the state, poor nodulation is a problem. Um, and obviously, the main source of nitrogen for soybean is nitrogen fixation uh, through the nodules. And, and so if we don't have good nodulation, we obviously tend to have some nitrogen deficiency. And so uh, if we suspect something like low um, nitrogen deficiency show up, uh, definitely one thing to evaluate is how good of a nodulation we have in the soybean at this point. And that's, that's one good indicator of potential uh, nitrogen issues. There are also other issues in the soil. Uh, one of the things that is often a key factor, uh, especially for micronutrients, is pH levels, especially iron chlorosis, very high pH, will essentially make the, the iron unavailable to the, to the soybean, and we do see uh, deficiencies issue in that case. So once more, again, that combination of soil analysis and plant tissue will tell us the, the whole story in this case. And again, as we're going uh, higher pH, um, western Kansas, but we also do see some cases in, in eastern Kansas where we do have areas, parts of the field perhaps that are high in pH. So we need to look at that very closely. These possible causes, though, some can be corrected, perhaps some can't. Is there anything that one should do at this point in the way of a, a supplemental application of that deficient nutrient? That's an excellent point, Eric, and, and that's often really the question is, uh, what can we do at this point? And, and this is where uh, every nutrient is going to be a little bit different. Um, if we're talking about nutrients like nitrogen or sulfur, uh, where we typically uh, are nutrients that we can do citrus. Uh, obviously, these are situations where we can actually do uh, applications and we see very good response. And these nutrients will move to the root zone and be available to that soybean during the growing season and we can see excellent results. And then we have other nutrients that we typically manage more on a pre-plan uh, type uh, system like phosphorus and potassium. Uh, and in those situations, obviously, uh, it's uh, more limited what we can do. We may not see, if we do any applications at this point, we may not see the full response that we will uh, expect if we do a, a pre-plan application. So in that type of situation, obviously, what we're trying to do is figure out what the problem is now so we can fix it for the next crop. And so I think that's very important also because oftentimes we say, well, Perhaps where there's not much we can do now, but we still need to figure out what the problem is because next crop in season, uh, crops is going to suffer as well, and we need to fix it. There are also other 
potentials, especially with micronutrients where we can do some foliar applications. In terms of results, in this case has been a little bit mixed. In some cases, we tend to see some benefit and in some cases, maybe not so much. A lot of this depends on the severity of the deficiency. And what we tend to see is in very severe chlorosis problems, foliar application is not enough to really have any significant impact. There's also many moving parts with foliar applications. Obviously, for absorption to happen through the leaves, there may have to be ideal conditions, and, and that may not necessarily be the case at the moment of application. And so oftentimes, we go back to either citrus application of some of these nutrients or, again, thinking about next year. One specific example, one study we have in the last uh, two or three years is uh, doing rescue application of potassium roughly at the V4 growth stage in, in soybeans where we see the deficiency and we basically do a top dress application of uh, KCL. And we've seen some, some positive results. However, going back to the uh, initial comment, we don't see the full response. Um, what we are seeing is that we maybe capture about 50% of the potential response with this type of application. Again, because potassium is a nutrient that we typically will have to apply pre-plan. And so again, it is an option uh, for a, a sort of a rescue application, but definitely it's not something that we should be planning on doing. It's really just um, potential rescue, at least part of the, the, the yield potential that we can capture this season. You have to consider those actions very carefully before you pull the trigger on any of that. As we've spoken of many times here, that plant tissue analysis can really be helpful to you producers in identifying what's going on with your uh, apparent nutrient deficient soybeans out there in the field. There's a great article on this very topic in the most recent Agronomy e-update newsletter. You can have a look at that at agronomy.ksu.edu. Important input here. Dorvar, thanks as always for coming over. Thank you. He's a crop nutrient specialist with K-State Research and Extension. That's Dorvar Ruiz Diaz opening up this Agriculture Today. This is Agriculture Today. I'm Shelby Varner. Technology is constantly progressing forward and cow-calf producers may be looking for software that can increase their record-keeping efficiency. There is a wide range of software that a cattle producer may choose from. However, software may not always be the answer, as was discussed in a recent Cattle Chat podcast from the Beef Cattle Institute at K-State. Also on this podcast, they discuss different possibilities of creep feeding calves during the remainder of the summer. Sharing input on these topics are veterinarians Bob Larson and Brad White and beef cattle nutritionist Philip Lancaster. What are some of the things that you guys use or recommend when you think about record keeping for cow calf operations? I've kind of changed my mind over the years in that you know, I've had some exposure to the dairy industry, some exposure to the swine industry. And in those industries, they have some really good computer-based record-keeping systems. But one of the big differences is the dairy guys are, are marketing product every day. And cow's lactation curve is moving every day. And so there is dynamic need for information frequently. Kind of the same thing with the swine guys. With beef cattle production, I mean, we breed cows over a couple of month period of time. And then we wean calves all on one day. And then we might retain those calves and then sell them to the feedlot or to a stalker operation a few weeks later. But there's not this daily need for updated on the fly information. So I've come back around to, I like computers. I like technology. I think there's some opportunities to capture some information that's really valuable, but the information needs on a kind of time dependent basis where computers really thrive it's not so much in beef cattle production. I think you can do really well with relatively simple programs or even paper-based records. Because like you said, we're not, there's not even data collection points very frequently that we would even collect data on a beef cattle operation, cow, especially cow-calf. So you can get by with something pretty simple. And the simpler it is, the more likely you are to use it. If it's too complicated and requires a lot of work on your part, you're a lot less likely to actually use it. And, and we worry about, you know, collecting the data, but even if you collect a lot of data and it just sits there, it's not doing you any good. So it's gotta be a system 
that you're going to collect the right data and that you're actually going to gain information from that data rather than just collecting data. I'll disagree a little bit yeah. on that because you guys are thinking cow records. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking the first thing that comes to me is thinking about grazing or management records. So oh, okay. movement and there are a couple apps out there that actually will allow you to put in your pastures and when did you move cows between this pasture and this pasture. And what I find useful is as you move them in and out, you go, okay, well, I'm kind of planning on this is going to last me a month. What did it last me last year? How long did I stay in there? What time of year did I move? And they're pretty simple to do. The part where I'll agree with you is if they're too complex, you just don't do it, right? It just falls off. So get something that's simple, easy to use. I want to also be, be careful that I'm not misinterpreted in that you know, I've got some experience uh, with several programs, the Cal-Calf 5 out of, out of the University of Nebraska, CHAPS, Cal360. You know, there, there's a number of programs that are out there that if you put the data in, they provide some really interesting and valuable data. A lot of that data really isn't at the individual level, but by putting data in at the individual level, I can get some cohort level, meaning I can see how my first calf heifers bred up and what their, weaning, their calves' weaning weights versus the cows, versus cows from this pasture and stuff. So there is some really good information that can come out of a lot of different programs. My, I guess my advice to producers would be what I would almost say the, the simplest program that gives you the information that you want. So I'm certainly in favor of record keeping some inventories, feed inventories, forage inventories, hay inventories, cattle inventories. Those types of records are absolutely essential and keeping track of prices and, and income. But that's a little bit different. Again, I'm going to, my brain immediately went to the individual animal records that we keep in some other industries. We don't really keep so much in, in cow calf. So we have our own special record keeping needs. Not that we don't need records, it's that they're kind of unique record keeping needs. It could be as simple as I a spreadsheet own. that you can access on your phone. It could be as simple as, and there are some good apps that there are some things that you can track, whether it's the amount of hay I delivered, the amount of hay I have, looking up information on cows. But I think simple, and you made that point, simple, easy to access is what we're looking for. And I think I'd add one thing too. I think if you're comparing different apps or different programs, look at how it's going to present the information to you. It's one thing to just collect and store the data, but if that app um, automatically will build or you can tell it to build, certain graphs and charts so you can track things over time or or compare this year to last year really easily and things like that it makes it a whole lot easier to get the knowledge and information out of there to make management decisions instead of you have to sit down and look at at raw data absolutely and there's a, a simple one as we've looked at and we've talked about before w weather data can be important and a lot of us like to look out and go man it's dry or it's wet but there are some of those that you can go in and you can just pull up for my specific area. Where are we on annual rainfall? Where are we in this month? Where are we now? So that can help. And especially we talk about weather as the grass gets a little bit dried out, it gets hot, it gets to midsummer. Sometimes our pastures get a little bit burnt up and we start thinking about what are the ways that I can supplement and make sure my calves are continuing to grow as well as they should. And a question often comes up, what about creep feeding? So I wanted to get you guys' opinions on, and, and let me give you a scenario. It is late July, I'm running really short on grass, and I wanna make sure that my calves, my spring-born calves continue to grow well. I'm thinking about taking out a creep feeder. I think this is a question that works great with a spreadsheet or a big chief tablet and a pencil, and, and just ask yourself about the costs versus the benefits. And my, I have a bias. In my opinion, most of the times that I have done that, where I've really pulled a pencil out and looked at it, what I would probably be better off doing is weaning the calves. Uh, we can wean calves, beef calves, at a relatively young age and have them really do well on a fairly simple diet of, you know, good quality forage and a supplement. You can actually wean calves, you know, at just a few weeks of age, two, three, four weeks of age. I've had real success anytime past six weeks in that their, their rumen has kind of developed well enough that it doesn't take a lot of my skill to, to handle those. And I, I'm going to say earlier than, I mean, we talk about early weaning. So July, they're not 
early, early, in my opinion. They're easy to wean at that stage. And I would rather do that and provide the feed to them directly than to leave them out on the cow, continuing lactation, continuing. And because those calves, by that time, they're not just drinking milk. They're eating a fairly high amount of that grass. And by pulling all the calves off, or at least the calves from the heifers or something like that, off that pasture, I've all of a sudden just increased the amount of grass available for the cows. Yeah, and well, and the if you're if you're trying to save grass, so there's a couple different ways to look at it. If you're trying to save grass, I'd agree with you. Weaning them is a whole lot more effective than creep feeding, because number one, you're going to pull the calf off the pasture, which at that age, that calf is probably eating you know two, three, four pounds of of grass a day. But then that cow is going to decrease her grass intake. She's not lactating anymore. So her intake is also going to decrease 20, 30 percent or, or so a, a day. And so that is going to save you quite a bit of forage if that's your goal. So creep, creep feeding, though, the expense is the feed itself. And so sometimes one of the discussions I think is important is what's the feed efficiency of creep feeding versus just weaning the calves and feeding them like you guys are proposing because what I'm hearing is I may actually end up taking out more feed to the calves because now I'm providing their whole diet and it might be more expensive is there a difference in efficiency well that's a well that's a tough question Brad because I don't know that we have any direct comparisons from that perspective that I know of what if we look at and I can give you some numbers but I don't know that they're really valid for that type of comparison because generally what we've done from a research perspective is we've compared creep feeding to no creep feeding or we've compared um, early weaning calves to not early weaning calves. I don't know that we've done a whole lot of research looking at early weaning calves compared to creep feeding calves. Of course, the other concept there is if I've got a calf that's on the cow and grazing pasture and eating creep feed, his rumen has to split and divide, not physically divide, but the bacteria have to say, I got to be able to digest this and this and this. Whereas if I wean him and no milk, we change his diet and he can adjust. He's going to be a little bit more efficient. So I think that's one of the things to watch out for too. And certainly creep feeding will make those calves a little bit heavier at weaning, but I'd watch the economics. And I'm going to go back to the very first yeah. thing you said, Bob, yeah. put a pencil get, to get it. Get a pencil out. Yeah. See, I'm not saying it's all, that, that my bias is always right, but I, I think it's a great place for a pencil and just say, well, what's my cost? What, what am I going to gain? That was part of a recent Cattle Chat podcast from the Beef Cattle Institute at K-State, featuring Bob Larson, Brad White, and Phil Lancaster. To listen to this full podcast and previous week's podcast, go to ksubci.org. I'm Shelby Varner, and we will return with more on Agriculture Today. You are tuned in to the K-State Radio Network and Agriculture Today. Welcome back. Eric Atkinson with you. Today's wheat harvest update for you concentrates on a four-county area in northwest Kansas that makes up the Twin Creeks Extension District. And the agricultural agent from that district we speak with today has a quick overview of harvest progress and results in those counties, Decatur, Norton, Sheridan, and Graham. Keith Van Skyke is with us. Keith, as we were talking prior to today's broadcast, uh, the wheat stands in that region were looking a little suspect coming out of the fall and through the winter, you say? Yes. Uh, we have kind of a, two different crops. we got the early planted crop that went in and, and came up reasonably well, and then things dried out a little bit, and, and uh, then we got the crop that didn't come up very good or very spotty. And to some extent, even though the seeds were in the ground and they were respiring and swelling up, didn't have a lot of, of sprouts coming out until later February, March, when we had some sleet and some snowy, wet stuff. And, and by golly, you'd get out there and dig around and you could see that, that they were still greening up and trying to get push out on out. And so it was very pessimistic as far as uh, it just uh, on some of the fields you just wondered if they were just going to end up 
cutting it for hay or uh, able to finish anything. But uh, we did have excellent moisture. Uh, it, was, it was looking pretty dim until about early, mid-April, and, and then pretty much floodgates opened up, and we really got a lot of good moisture. I was just I was just at Trigo County last night. I was judging their grass, and and uh, my gosh, their, their blue stem is almost five foot high, and right. so that's a lot of difference than before when you just don't have as much moisture. Yeah. So that really did that was our saving grace there, and we did have a little bit longer filling time, and although there's been some skips and some jumps between it, and as typical with about any. You know, wheat crop, you kill it nine times. <laughs> That's right. The uh, moisture of late now, has that impeded cutting progress? Sure. We've been having spot rains, uh, thunderstorms, uh, not a lot of extreme damage uh, as far as uh, bad weather, et cetera, but just aggravating uh, mud holes and uh, humidity and uh, spotty rain here and there. And... Uh, that kind of slows it down for two or three days. You know, you like to, once it's done and finished with uh, uh, berries, you like to get it out of there as fast as you can. So are your producers nearing completion of harvest, or they still have a few yeah. fields to cut out? As I uh, kind of drive around and call around, I, uh, I would say, especially visiting with elevators whatnot, they they're probably... Two thirds to three fourths done. Uh, several people I've talked to said, "Oh, maybe two good days they'll be done, or um, you know, first the next week if it stays dry and warms up a little bit." So I would say that's been a little slower than we usually see it coming in, mm-hmm. and they are exclaiming that it's probably a little more optimistic than they thought it would be. Some of the uh, yields have been, uh, you know, 40s, 45, up to 60, 65, 70 maybe. Probably be about, average out to be uh, about that 45 to 50 range. Uh, But we have some good wheat, uh, surprisingly, and we wouldn't have gotten that without the moisture. And test weights were really high early, and now they're starting to sag down Mm -hmm. with the humidity and the moisture and the delay. One operator told me, you know, 63, 62, that was common early. Uh, Most of the guys started somewhat getting out there in the field about 1st of July or just a day or two before that and maybe test cut or come back in a little bit later. But now the test weights are in the upper 50s, 56, 58, Mm -hmm. just due to the length of the Uh, temperatures and humidity that's putting a stress on it. But still not bad, really. Not bad, not bad. Uh, Just looks a lot better than what I thought it would. Other variables that might have affected this crop, did that late freeze take any toll at all, Keith? Yeah, we had a couple of times when we had one evening, maybe, maybe a couple evenings where it got down to that point. And depending on what the stage of the wheat was, as it was later, and uh, we did have a uh, early May, just a little snap, and um, that wheat was probably trying to flower, or uh, the heads were out and just getting ready to flower, and so that's a very critical time frame. Uh, they don't like cold temperatures at that point. But we have several areas that had white heads, and mm-hmm. uh, I talked about the differences and why we have what we're seeing when we have white heads, and. One was a little bit of uh, frost. You see some of that. And then we did have some disease, uh, fusarium, head bite, the, uh, the tombstone kernels that don't fill up the right way at that time when it's flowering, and they get infected with that fungus. Some of that, and then a little bit of frost. And then we were having a striped rust problem, and that really was slow coming on, and then... We had temperatures there in the, you know, nights, evenings would get down to 60 and and 58 and for a couple of weeks and damp weather. And we were headed there for a problem. And 
and then the the heat broke up one and it kind of dried that out but several guys sprayed for that at the right time and if the temperatures would have stayed cooler and wetter we would have really been in trouble but the fungicides work good if they're put on the right time and so we did have some uh, stripe rust too a little bit of everything thrown at this crop in that four county area but when it's all said and done not a bad harvest at all, and it speaks to the durability of winter wheat in Kansas, Keith. Yes, it does. It's uh, certainly true that it's the staff of life because, <laughs> you know, we produce the best bread wheat, and we got to have that. So, yeah, the genetics and are very important in the keeping up with the rust and adaptations, and they're working on them, and they're working. That's why we keep having new varieties very well. Keith, we appreciate the recap. Take care. Many thanks. You bet, Eric. Thank you for calling. Extension Agricultural Agent Keith Van Skyke. He's based in the Twin Creeks Extension District in northwest Kansas. That's comprised of Decatur, Norton, Sheridan, and Graham counties. That's today's Kansas Wheat Harvest Report here on Agriculture Today. This is Agriculture Today. Stop, look, and listen. In places, a branch has broken off the tree and now reaches into the hayfield. That's Gus Vanderhoven of Kansas State University with comment on life in rural Kansas. It is at this time of the year that nature is about to take over with its abundance of growth. Everything is growing and it all looks lush and green. We've had good rains and that has pushed growth, especially the weeds. But now the wheat should be in the bin and corn and beans are growing. It is early summer in Kansas. The harvest of wheat fields look bleached. Some farmers followed wheat harvest with the baler and rolled up the chaff and the stalks in large, tight bales to be sold to the nurseries for mulch or to a horse stable for bedding. I walked by my neighbor's harvested wheat field and along the edge I found a few stalks with full heads. I carefully picked and brought them home. Annika placed them in a tin vase and it stands next to the open fireplace celebrating the 2021 wheat harvest. We have not grown wheat or beans for many years. It's actually hay we grow now. All of our hay has been cut, cured and baled. Most of it has been hauled off and taken home. It's when I drove the cleaned hay fields that I noticed the work that needs to be done. I need to bush hog or mow along the edges to stop the woods from encroaching further into the fields. There's always that fringe of Rome left standing where the swather does not dare to reach. And I know why, as I circle the field, slowly driving the pickup truck. In places, a branch has broken off the trees and now reaches into the hay field. The swather made a wide swing around it. And I don't blame them. Swathers are not cheap. And of course, we will have the whole winter to clear around the fields and cut the branches and sometimes trees which fall into good firewood. That's how we have done it before, and we will do it again. But it is now that I see it all fresh, and there's the urge and inner need to keep it all clean and neat. There's that one stretch where musk thistle invades on the south wind. It comes from the old and now abandoned feedlot south of the east-west road. It's a nuisance. I reminded the weed department to spray the road and kill the thistle. I've looked and seen weevil activity in the seed heads, and there, spraying is a dilemma. I see young trees sprout up. We will get them next time we burn. But there are always a few which escape, and it doesn't take long before it is a small tree. Next thing you know, you have a fence post, if it is an Osage orange. And 
only a few more years and you have a sturdy corner post. It's amazing how far things grow at this time of the year and how empty corners fill in. I look where the beavers have happily chewed and where two trees are sprouting with several branches. Deer love it. It's all fresh, green nibbling, close to the ground. No need to reach up and make umbrella trees. I call the deciduous tree an umbrella tree where cattle or deer have stood under the tree and reached up and nibbled everything they could reach. From a distance, such a tree can look like an open umbrella. No twigs or leaves close to the ground, and there is the branch line parallel with the ground. This is the time of the year I am contemplating investing in another tractor and bush hog to mow and to control unwanted growth. And it is at this time I especially remember my brother-in-law who said, your problem will be that you will want to keep the farm as neat as a Dutch farm, which is not totally true. I have my limits. As I'm writing this, a thunderstorm rolls through it, and it rains, rains, and rains. It's no wonder plants want to grow. The sun came through, and oh, the humidity. It could be the tropics. Plants love it. I bet you if I sat in my chair next to a cornfield, I could hear the plants pop and watch them grow. While in college in Australia, I kept busy over the weekends and worked for farmers. I would cultivate corn fields with a team of horses while the corn was still small, holding promise on the rich river bottom soils along the Hawkesbury River. I also would take over the milking for the weekend and study in between. Those were not the large dairies we know today. They ran 40 to 45 cows and most used the herringbone milking parlor. But by yourself, gathering the cows and cleaning kept you busy. I kept the parlor quiet, and cows tended to know their turn and place. I liked to do it, and it paid well. Sometimes I had to move the electric fence to put the cows on a fresh strip of grass to graze. If needed, I moved the irrigation up to the recently gray strip and irrigated it to stimulate new growth. Those farms along the river valley were well organized and neat farms with rectangular fields. It made farming easy. But I must admit that our farm in Pottawatomie County with its twisted creeks and gullies and wooded glens and springs is from a landscape point of view, much more interesting. Yes, there is all the abundance of growth in early summer. It's part of it. And deep down, I love it. Not even so very deep down. I just love the land. Gus Vanderhoven of Kansas State University with his weekly commentary on life in rural Kansas. That's our time for today. On tomorrow's broadcast, K-State's Jonathan Aguilar will be along for an extended look at crop irrigation technology advances and his research program in that area. That and more here tomorrow. We invite you to be here as well. Meantime, Eric Atkinson bidding you a good day for Agriculture Today. This is the K-State Radio Network.